Hello everyone, TMR here, and today I am going to be doing a review of the book Needful Things by Stephen King. Needful Things is a horror novel written by Stephen King that was released in 1991. It is 736 pages long and it is about a shopkeeper who moves into the town of Castle Rock, Maine and sells good in exchange for money and services. It was the first novel written by Stephen King after his rehab from drug and alcohol addiction, and it was adapted into a film in 1993, um, but that film has poor reviews. A fun fact about Needful Things is that the title and art style on one of the covers was used as inspiration for both the name and the art style for Netflix's Stranger Things series. So I'm going to start with a synopsis of the plot, so major spoilers ahead here. So Castle Rock, Maine is a small town, and the opening of a new store is big news. Um, the town is really buzzing with anticipation for the opening of Needful Things, which brands itself as a new type of store. Uh, the owner of this store is Leland Gant, and he is a charming older salesman who claims to be from Akron, Ohio. Leland Gant is portrayed as tall, caring, um, a sophisticated person at times. His charm is one of his best sales weapons, and he can get strangers to instantly like him. An example of this is when 11-year-old Brian Rusk entered ne Needful Things, and he was his first customer. Leland even opened the store a day early for Brian. Brian Rusk felt that Mr. Gant had an infectious smile and couldn't help but feel an instant liking for the man. Now, Gant is also not the best businessman, apparently, because he has items that his customers would deem invaluable, um, and he lets them have them for a fraction of what they're worth. The first example of this is Brian Rusk, um, the first customer in the store. Mr. Gant lets him have a 1956 Sandy Koufax rookie card for only 85 cents. The card was even signed to Brian. Um, so that was only half the cost, however, because Leland Gant wants Brian to pull a prank uh, on somebody else to complete payment for the card. Now this is the basis of how the entire story of Needful Things goes. So Gant sells a citizen of Castle Rock something they really desire, like Brian and the card, or Brian's mother and the sunglasses that made her be able to be romantic with Elvis, and in addition to a small cash payment, usually just whatever they have in their pockets, Mr. Gant needs them to pull a small prank for him. Now Mr. Gant's charm is more like a hypnotizing aura, and this is extended to the items that he sells. Um, these are no ordinary items. One of the main characters in this book is Polly Chambers, and she's a character whose arthritis is so bad that her hands are borderline crippled at the beginning of the book. Gaunt eventually sells her a necklace that, when worn, takes the pain away from her hands. Now here you could see a reason why Polly would be so obsessed with the item that she bought in Needful Things. It's understandable why she would be so protective of that necklace. Um, that's another theme in the book. Every character is possessive of the items they buy in Needful Things, and they're so possessive that they become very paranoid that somebody's going to try to steal it from them, because it's that important to them. They put the item before everything else in their life, and they become so obsessed with that item that nothing else matters to them anymore. The items have such a strong hold over each character, it's strong enough that none of them mind pulling a prank in order to finish paying for it. When said prank is usually more like a mean trick and something that this character would never have done otherwise. This is where we really start to see the evil genius of Leland Gaunt come into play. You know. Gaunt really creates a web of deceit in the town of Castle Rock. His basic formula is that he takes two people who have a minor feud in the town and turns it into an all-out war. He does this by having the pranks pulled on each person in the feud and elaborately frames each person for that prank. The first example of this in Needful Things was between Nettie Cobb and Wilma Jerzyk. To condense it down, Wilma and Nettie already disliked each other because of a disagreement a little while back about Nettie's dog barking in the night. And, well, it just so happens that Brian Rusk's prank is throwing mud all over Wilma's white sheets, which are on a clothesline drying. 
and the way it happened, Wilma automatically believes that it was Nettie who threw the mud on the sheets. So then Gaunt later has another customer of his, a man named Hugh Priest, murder Nettie's, Nettie's dog and frame Wilma for it. Now what was once a minor feud explodes into murderous hate for each other and they end up savagely killing each other out on the street in broad daylight. Now to completely oversimplify it and not to take anything away from this book, um, but if you take that formula and repeat it about eight or nine times, um, that's pretty much needful things right there. Now, certainly there has to be a protagonist to counter Leland Gant, and it is a man by the name of Alan Pangborn. Now, he's the sheriff of Castle Rock, and he's suspicious of Gant throughout the book, and Leland does everything he can to distract Alan or steer clear of him, because it seems like he knows that he's a worthy adversary. Now, as the novel progresses, it becomes clear that Gaunt is not a person of this earth, and he may even be the devil himself. He's hypnotizing and charming, um, but whenever a customer in the store happens to shake his hand or touch him accidentally, they become almost violently ill, and it's, it's almost enough to pull them out of the state of hypnosis he has over them. Now, Alan remembers, towards the end of the novel, Alan remembers a quote from his grandmother saying, The devil's voice is sweet to hear. And I think that's a perfect representation of Leland because he, he's charming, you know, he, he doesn't look like a devil. He looks like a sophisticated old man selling things in a shop. Leland really is a master of deception um, because the items he sells the, his customers look to them to be in pristine, new condition. Um, but in reality, they are often broken, grimy, rotting, and not even the same item that um, the customer thinks they have. Uh, one example of this is Norris's prized bazoon fishing rod. Uh, when he comes to his senses, he actually realizes that it's really nothing more than a rotting collection of a few twigs. Now, Mr. Gant times all his pranks and tricks so that Castle Rock is essentially going to come to an end all on the same night. He has murderous feuds come to a head and there's bombs planted all around the town. It is at this point where characters including Alan, Polly, and Norris have become wise to Mr. Gaunt, and they race to his shop to confront him. Now in one of my favorite parts of the entire book, Alan gets to needful things first, and he enters for the first time in the entire novel. Now as a reader, I was waiting for this moment for the entire book, and it didn't come until all the way at page number 686. And Alan is a man who carries great trauma in his life, um, because in the past, his wife and young son were killed in an automobile crash. Now, in Gaunt's greatest trick, he offers Alan the videotape of the accident so he could finally see for himself what happened that day, because he spent many sleepless nights going over his last encounter with his son and wife and what could have possibly went wrong, because she was a safe driver. The video Leland shows Alan, like all of his other merchandise, is fake and Gaunt frames another character, Ace Merrill, for causing the accident, and they are ready to kill each other, because Leland framed Alan for stealing all of Ace Merrill's grandfather's money. Polly Chambers, who dates Alan throughout the novel, reaches him before he goes off and tries to murder Ace Merrill. When Polly reaches Alan, she is able to explain to him that Gant made mistakes in the video, proving it to be fake. This leads to a final confrontation between Alan and Mr. Gant, this ends in Alan using the power of the white to force Gaunt out of town. Alan also takes Gaunt's suitcase of stolen souls and is able to release them from their prison. Grimly, the book ends with Gaunt setting up a new shop called Answered Prayers in a different town. So that is an extremely condensed version of Needful Things, and I am certainly not doing it justice condensing 730 pages into a few paragraphs. Now to talk about what I liked and what I disliked about the book. I will say that a lot of characters had tremendous depth and were written really beautifully. Alan's struggle with depression because of his past was well documented. He had to learn to leave the past in the past so it wouldn't let affect his future. Polly experienced something similar as she also had a very traumatic past because she went through the loss of her child. She had to learn about not being ashamed of who she is and not running from her fears. Even side characters like Danforth Keaton who is the town's corrupt head selectman, 
is given a deep background and had a really great character arc where he slowly si slipped into a paranoid madness. Now, anytime Gaunt was on the page, I found myself hooked. And King really wrote him so well, giving him a lot of mystique and charm, while at the same time being repulsive and having struggles pretending to be nice and care about the interests of his customers. You could really feel the control Gaunt had over the town. As is usual with Stephen King's novels, the setting was great, especially towards the climax of the book. The way he described the big thunderstorm and the pandemonium on Castle Rock's last day was really epic. I also just really liked the plot of the book, you know, a store where you could be sold to your heart's desire at a price, um, which always seemed like a steal at the time, but then of course really turned out to be everything you had. I will say that the middle portion of the book did drag a bit for me, and I found it very slow moving at times. I even feel like it got a bit repetitive at points, with large chunks of the middle of the book just kind of involving more pranks being set up and feuds happening. Having all these tricks and feuds set up did help lead to a big feeling of craziness and pandemonium when it all came to a head on Castle Rock's last day, um, which I believe was King's goal there. But it did feel at times that there was just too many different side characters and too many different pranks being set up, that, and I feel like some of them could have been cut out to trim the length of the book. Also, I really didn't like the ending of this book. The way King framed it was kind of like, Gant was using magic, just like Alan likes to use magic, but of course Gant was using, using magic as deception for evil, and Alan ended up using his magic for good. By using his magic for good, Alan was able to have the power of the white flow through him through a magic tr trick in his wristwatch. So this is the seventh Stephen King novel I've read, and I know he has a very large amount of books and short stories, um, but I wouldn't say I'm a novice to his work, and I'm not familiar with the lore of the white, so I had to look that up after I finished the book. Now, from what I found on the internet, the white is the force of good that is led by God. Uh, which I believe is the god of the entire Stephen King universe. The white is an elemental force that represents wholeness, unity, and health. The white fight against their counterpart, which is the outer dark, and that is led by the Crimson King. So that's all according to StephenKingFandom.com. It really kind of bummed me out that the ending of this book relied on lore from another Stephen King series that I had not read. Um, you know, this book came out in 1991, so if someone read it back then and was not familiar with the lore of the White, they would kind of be out of luck, um, and they'd kind of be left at a loss on what happened. The book is billed as the last Castle Rock story, however, so I guess that is kind of a way of saying it's not completely a standalone book, even though it necessarily doesn't have a prequel or a predecessor. Also about the ending, while the book was fantasy throughout, it felt like fantasy that was still grounded in reality. It was almost believable. Then um, it really kind of confused me how, in the ending, Alan, who is just a normal man, a normal sheriff, was able to use this godlike power of the white um, to banish Gant from the town. I did like how the book ended with Gaunt setting up a shop in a different town, um, because not, not long before Gaunt set up in a different town, while Alan was um, having his big confrontation with him, he really thought to himself that he understood that he probably couldn't put an end to this thing. And the thing he was talking about was Leland. And it's just, what does Leland represent in this book? You know, he represents greed. He represents selfishness, lust, and jealousy. Things that are not just going to go away. You know, Alan can banish it from his town, um, but not after it got into the residence and really poisoned them all and essentially destroyed the entire place. For the reasons I just listed, I'm going to give Needful Things a grade of B-. It had its moments where it really shined and really had me hooked to each page, um, but it also felt longer than it needed to be at times, and I really didn't love the ending. Overall, I think it's a good novel and worth the read, but I've read better from Stephen King. So, that is my review of Needful Things by Stephen King. I want to thank you for giving me your time and tuning into this video, and I would love to know your opinion on this book if you happen to read it. And if not, 
Well then, I'm sorry for spoiling the entire thing for you. So that's all I have for you today, and I want to thank you for lending me your time, and I'll see you next time.